Hello, listeners. I wanted to let you know that on Friday, October 15th at 7 p.m. Pacific, I'll be hosting a two-hour online event with the Oregon Friends of Jung. We'll explore the basic principles of Jungian dreamwork and offer attendees techniques and skills to foster deepened understanding of your dream world, psyches, and waking lives. I hope to see you there. We'll put the link in the show notes where you can sign up. Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today we have an exciting new guest on our show, Jonathan Shedler, who is a bit of a darling to all of us in the psychoanalytic field. He came forward very bravely and with no small measure of chutzpah to publish an article called The Efficacy of Psychodynamic Psychotherapy. And he fought hard to bring this information forward, which in some ways was rather suppressed in the academic worlds, where he was able to demonstrate that psychodynamic psychotherapy is equally, if not more effective than many different modern therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. He is a clinical professor at the University of California, San Francisco. He has published numerous articles. He is the creator of the Schedler Weston Assessment Procedure. And uh, something which I'm thrilled about, he was the co-author of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, which I use all the time, by the way, uh, which is incredibly helpful. Jonathan is here to talk to us about his research and about his advocacy for the viability and the importance of psychodynamic elements and features in psychotherapy. So welcome, Jonathan. It's uh, marvelous to have you here today. Thank you. I'm happy to be here with you. So if we were to just kind of jump right into it, we're talking first about the 2010 article that really shook up some people and made a lot of academics and researchers think differently about the validity of psychodynamic psychotherapy. Can you tell us a little bit about your process in bringing that forward and what motivated you to do this? Sure. So just to provide some context, perhaps your regular listeners are, are familiar, but in case someone isn't, there's been a movement in the mental health professions. It's really been going on for, for two to three decades now, away from the way most experienced therapists understand therapy. Most of us understand therapy to mean talk therapy. So it's a process of exploration and inquiry aimed at deeper self-understanding. And 
You know, the idea is that people should be able to overcome difficulties, symptoms, you know, problems, but but the goal of the therapy is really, you know, much broader than that. It's to know ourselves more fully, to become more whole, and to be able to live our lives more richly and fully. And I think when most people in the in educated public think about therapy, I think that's what they have in mind. Over the past 25 years or so, something else has been happening in training programs in psychology. It's been taken over by what's called evidence-based therapy. And the idea is that the therapy has to be tested in a, you know, controlled, in a controlled experiment. The experiments are modeled after you know, drug trials, you know, the way we would evaluate the, you know, the effectiveness of a, of a potential new drug. And so they're studied in research experiments. The researchers not the patients define what they consider to be a good outcome, right? So we get, and, and all of the, all of these treatments are conducted with worksheets and instruction manuals. There's little, literally an instruction manual that lays out the course of treatments and the interventions and homework assignments and so on that are going to be followed in advance. So the, the therapy is really educational. Like the therapist is in the role of coach, trainer, educator, the therapist has information and answers. It's in the worksheets, it's in their manuals, and you come in and it it has a bit of an assembly line quality to it. You know, the treatment follows from a DSM diagnosis, and once the diagnosis is determined, you know, then the sequence of interventions is determined and laid out in a treatment manual. Well, that's a very, very different approach to therapy. And 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 the outcome that's of interest in these research studies is generally your your score on a DSM-based symptom checklist. So it's not concerned with knowing ourselves more fully. It's not concerned with becoming more of a, a more whole person. It's not concerned with living life more fully and freely. It's concerned with managing or alleviating a certain specific set of symptoms. And in, it's very important also, it, it's not just that it's about accountability and science and research. Virtually all of these therapies are very, very brief. Eight to 12 sessions is the norm. From the point of view of a real therapist, what I would call a real therapist, <laughs> you know, in eight to twelve sessions, you've barely said hello. I mean, yeah. the therapy process is really just beginning. So the field has been taken over by what's called evidence-based therapy, which, from my point of view and the point of view of an awful lot of experienced clinicians, I'm pretty sure you included, is pushing a very superficial approach to therapy, mm. and. It's it's not just you know it, it's not just that it's the narrative is that these therapies are proven they're the gold standard they're superior to other forms of treatment specifically psychoanalytic or psychodynamic treatments right and this is the kind of treatment that people should be asking for the this is a contemporary approach to treatment psychoanalytic treatments which are based on reflection, self-reflection, understanding, insight. Those are passe, they're outmoded, they've been debunked. Science shows that you know, these, I'm going to call them worksheet therapies or workbook therapies, science shows that these are superior. And actually what my, so what my paper uh, on the efficacy of psychodynamic therapy was about, first of all, it was so hard to publish it because that's the prevailing narrative in the field. And I, you know, I guess if you repeat a lie often enough, you know, people start to believe it. The lie is that it's superior. Yeah. And in fact, that's not what the research shows. What the research actually shows is that psychoanalytic therapies, meaning talk therapy, right, aimed at self-understanding, are every bit as every bit as effective in the short run. They seem to be considerably more effective in the long run. And you know, academic researchers and health insurers, by the way have been selling the public a bill of goods about mm. what good therapy is. Well, th those are really bold claims. And there's so much in what you just said, a, a lot to unpack. First of all, I, I love this idea that what's measured in many of these uh, research studies is not at all how a, a therapist might measure success or a patient might measure success. And yeah. uh, I, I'm thinking about my own experience. You know, I started in Jungian analysis uh, in 1996, and I was I was living in New York City. And at the time, my the cost of my analysis was it, it was costing me as my analysis was co costing me as much as my rent. <laughs> 
Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it was very quickly into, you know, the five figures and it, it's, it's kind of an extraordinary amount of money. But I remember thinking at the time, you, you know, I'd gone in with, with some specific issues that needed to be untangled and there was an inner manifestation of them that, that left me feeling, you know, quite unhappy and then there was sort of an outer manifestation of them in that there were things I wanted in my life that I couldn't figure out how to get. And, you know, in something like four years, those things were taken care of. And uh, if you ask me, was that a good deal? I would say, heck yes. That was a re- that was a bargain. Yeah. Let me just amplify that. You know, so the goal of so-called evidence-based therapies or, you know, manual driven work worksheet therapies is to reduce specific symptoms defined by you know DSM by the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders and so therapy is considered successful if there's improvement in your symptoms for most people and what you just described most people most of the time you know yeah there there's symptoms present and and they're concerning and you know of course we want to alleviate the symptoms but most people want much, much more from therapy, right? The idea of, of psychoanalytic and psychoanalytically informed therapies isn't just to you know, alleviate, you know, a, a sort of, you know, checklist of symptoms. The goal really is to transform our lives in a mm. way that matters. I mean, it, it's not just that our symptoms are different after treatment. It's that we are different after treatment. We are a different people. Yeah, definitely. I was a different person. I had one uh, one person that I worked with for a little while. She <laughs> she's very funny, and she came in one day and she sat down and she said, "Did you give me a personality transplant?" <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was adorable. Jonathan, um, as you were moving through your academic training, you're a PhD. I imagine that you were not necessarily exposed to a lot of psychoanalytic thought, as many universities don't teach it very frequently. How did you become so interested in that, just in terms of your life story? <laughs> uh, well, uh, so actually, I was exposed to it. Ah. People today don't have the opportunity to be exposed to it in graduate training the way I was. Mm. So I went to grad school at the University of Michigan, which was you know, one of the last you know, remaining major research-oriented university programs that had a, a clinical program that was very psychoanalytically oriented. It was like being in an analytic institute. Right? And, and, but you can't get that anymore. No one can get it. It doesn't exist even at Michigan. Right? The program that, that I, you know, the program that I was part of was, was dismantled. And now it's all about you know, evidence-based therapy and basic science research and, you know, and, and CBT. So I mean, people ask me all the time, how do I follow, your, you know, how do I follow in your footsteps? How do I get the kind of training that, that you got? And, and the answer is that in, in university settings, with, I mean, precious few exceptions, you can't get that training anymore. You have to get it elsewhere. But you asked something else. How did I get interested? And I'll tell you a story. It's a little embarrassing to tell, but I'll, I'll tell it anyway. <laughs> oh, we, we love embarrassing stories. <laughs> so, so when I was in when I was in college, I was an economics major. Actually, talk about being in the wrong place. <laughs> and for, and uh, but, I I had a professor who was a psychologist, and I was just entranced by listening to him talk, listening to him talk about people and about human psychology. I, you know, I, I sort of followed him around like a little you know duckling, just just you know <laughs> waiting for him to, to bestow words of wisdom, and. I had a girlfriend at the time, my, my first girlfriend, my, you know, my first true love, um, the first person I ever had sex with. And she had a dream. She told me the dream and I told the professor the dream. And it was a, it was a pretty good experiment because he didn't know whose dream it was and he didn't know the circumstances that gave rise to the dream. So I'm going to tell you what he didn't know, which is the circumstances. The circumstances were, this is the embarrassing part, we had had sex using a condom and the condom broke. And we were freaking the hell out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, that was bad enough. But then she missed her period, her next period. Oh. So we were we were Ooh. certain. 
that she was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you couldn't get a you know, home pregnancy test. You had to go to the doctor and you had to wait to get the results. So, so she had this dream between the time that she got the pregnancy test and, and the results. The dream was that we were, she and I were, there were several parts to it. You know, one, one part was that we were in a car and we were driving somewhere together and we were driving over bridges, you know, crossing different kinds of bodies of, of water, you know, lakes, streams, rivers, or bridges over, over water. And then the scene changed and um, we were in a store to buy a hat and, and I was trying on different hats one after another. And and there were there was some more to it, but <laughs> that's <laughs> that's enough for present purposes. So um, you know, I was used to hang out with this professor when he let me, and we'd talk about different things. And I said, you know, a friend of mine had this dream. So he didn't know it was my girlfriend's dream. He didn't know we were concerned that she might be pregnant. He sure as, sure didn't know about the broken condom. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know that I had a girlfriend. And and I told him the dream, and he just interrupted me in you know mid sentence I, I told him the part about the you know driving over water he was very formal he called me mr shedler he said mr mr shedler he says water represents birth crossing over bridges and not going in the water represents <laughs> represents a wish to avoid birth that is to avoid getting pregnant trying on hats covering the head with a hat represents covering the head of your penis with a condom and he looked. He just looked me in the eye, and he said, "The dream represents your girlfriend's wish to avoid getting pregnant by having you use a condom." And I thought, <laughs> you know, and, and it was it like was, magic. And exactly, it was, it blew it was, you away. I, I mean, if yeah, I mean, if the heavens had you know parted, and and his words were you know accompanied by celestial trumpets, I, I couldn't have been more blown away. Yeah. You know, the only thing he didn't know, you know, we were using a condom, and what happened, but. It was just, I was like, yeah. this is not an accident. The chance right. of him coming up with this, you know, by, by, you know, randomly or by coincidence is, is just zero. And, and I, I, obviously I was already interested in psychology. I just didn't know that I wanted to be a psychologist or a psychoanalyst. And, and my thought at the time was, after I recovered my composure and got done blushing and, you know, <laughs> dying a thousand deaths, <laughs> I thought was if there are people in the world who, who understand this kind of thing, yeah, I, I have to be one of them. Oh. That's an extraordinary story. Hmm. And a real initiation. I mean, it kind of opened the door to this whole new continent. Yeah. And, and the continent was, you know, it's funny. I, I hadn't thought about this until now because the, this this whole capture of the field of psychology by you know by academic researchers and scientism hadn't really happened then. But you know, but it was still it was already becoming fashionable even back then. Bashing Freud was fashionable. Bashing psychoanalysis was fashionable. And I remember thinking, well, first of all, I was like, oh my god, you know, <laughs> like this is true. <laughs> like, right. like Freud was onto something. There yeah. really is such a thing as a, there really is such a thing as an unconscious. There's such a thing as unconscious meaning. Our dreams are not random, like the scientists are telling us. Our dreams are you know, rich tapestries of meaning that can be understood. So you know, in a way, it was like the scale because I guess I was in doubt. You know, you hear a lot of different things unless you go deeply into the study of psychoanalytic psychology. You know you hear a lot of trash talk about it and you don't know what to believe. And, you know, like that was the moment I think I was already heading toward, you know, there's something here that's really important that I want to go more deeply into. But I think that was the moment was like, aha, yeah, <laughs> this is real. So I'm just wondering along that line, if we were to imagine that, academic psychology is a collective person. What is that person defending against by stripping the value out of analytic insight? They're defending against emotional life, and they're defending against the recognition that we are not governed by you know, logic and intellect, right? That It's a defense against the unconscious, isn't it? It is because it says because it's it says in effect 
that there's no more meaning to things than meets the eye. If you want to know what's going on with somebody psychologically, we'll just you know give them a questionnaire and they'll just tell you for the asking. It's like so a five-point Likert scale or yeah, something, yeah. You know, rating scale. How agreeable are you? <laughs> you know, how conscientious are you? Mm-hmm. And it's a denial of the fact that the mind is divided against itself, that we are of two two minds or many minds about a great many things, that you know, vitally important things go on outside of awareness, but, but many of them can be brought into awareness by, you know, the, a certain therapeutic method. I mean, it's, it's a denial of all of that. So that's an interesting question. And of course, you know, unconscious processes, the evidence for that is uh, really abundant in uh, some of the neuroscience that's coming out. So I don't think there's any question about the evidence it. evidence has been abundant for decades. Yes. And, and, and there's a really funny Paradox would be a nicer word. Hypocrisy would be not so nice a word. <laughs> um, there's a in in the academic world, which is everybody knows this research. Yeah. Right? So it's not just neuro. We have research from neuroscience. You know, consciousness is the tip of the iceberg, sure. and that is true from a neurobiological perspective. Yes. We know it's true. Yes. We know it has to be true. And and there's also research from experimental psychology itself, right? So. Mm-hmm. Dan, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for mm. research demonstrating that we're not, you know, that we're not fully consciously aware of how we perceive the world and make decisions. And he showed this through experiments. And he doesn't use psychoanalytic language. He talks about system one and system two. There's, <laughs> there's two, you know, there's sort of two cognitive systems at work, and one of them is is conscious. We're aware of it. It's accessible through introspection. Right? It, it's sort of consciously guided. And then there's another system that's emotionally driven that happens automatically. It's implicit. Quickly, right? That's, that's um, you know, that it largely happens outside of awareness. And, um, and that gave rise to, he wrote a, a book that's a bestseller that's accessible to the public. Right? But he's a Nobel Prize winning scientist. And the book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. And mm. fast thinking refers to the system that operates automatically and, and unconsciously. Right? So we know from neuroscience and we know from experimental psychology that and, and much, common sense, honestly, too. Like, to, I and, think we and just the, know. And the poets have known for ages yes. since ancient antiquity. Right? So you know, we know that much of mental life, you know, isn't consciously accessible or readily consciously accessible. And academic researchers know this. And the paradox or the hypocrisy is they are advocating exclusively forms of psychotherapy that don't acknowledge that. That's a question that I have is, and, and this is just my, my ignorance, I think, about some of these worksheet types of therapies. Do these therapies make room for the unconscious, things like DBT or CBT? Is is there an acknowledgement of the significance of the unconscious in these manualized therapies? You know, let me answer that with a bit of a digression. So I, I actually, um, I tend not to use the word the unconscious, which makes it sound like it's some, you know, something mysterious or some reified place. There isn't one you know, one unconscious, right? There is a multiplicity of many, many different mental processes that are unconscious in, in, in lots of different ways and that are kind of operating in parallel. So, you know, the idea of the unconscious really comes from psychoanalysis from back when, but I think a more you know, sort of contemporary research-based view is uh, there are unconscious processes, and there are many of them. So, so I tend okay. to say unconscious processes or unconscious mental life, rather than than the unconscious. So, to what extent do manualized therapies take into account unconscious processes? As far as I'm concerned, if you read the manuals, none whatsoever. They don't take it. They don't take it into account. Right. So, you know, for instance, in CBT. Uh, you know, one of the things that they might look at is your un, uh, what they call automatic thoughts, right? You you have some kind of experience, you have automatic thoughts or, or beliefs about what it means that maybe you haven't been paying a lot of attention to, and they get you to say or write down your automatic thoughts. 
But, you know, what's embedded in that method is we can find it out just for the asking. You know, all we need to do is we'll we'll give you a worksheet. And on one side, you can write down, you know, experiences that, uh, you know, experiences that you're going to examine. And on the other side, you write down the thoughts that come to mind about it. And, you know, that may be revealing to an extent, but, but the assumption is we can just find out for the asking. So there's an ex- an assumption that we can plumb the unconscious, and, and there are, I know I'm using that term, but we can plumb it with our conscious mind. No, we, there's a, we, no. The assumption is it doesn't exist. If if we can't if we can't find it out, you know, for the asking, if the person can't tell us about it or write it on a worksheet, we can ignore it. We can treat it as it. irrelevant. Now, there's okay. a bit of. Um, I learned a new term recently, so I'm going to trot it out. It's uh, there's a, a bit of a, of a, a Mott and Bailey um, sleight of hand that goes on. So, for listeners who don't, might not know the term, a Mott and Bailey refers to a, a medieval castle setup. And and what happens is I forget which is which, but life would go on, and I, I think the the Bailey, the the town, right? That's where the the livestock and the crops and the markets all went in. You know, that's where life happened. But when they were attacked by an enemy, they would retreat to the the mott, which was a cold stone tower. Nobody wanted to be there, right? it, but it was it was impregnable. Right? So they would retreat to the tower and you know wait until the attackers you know wore themselves out or moved on, and then they would go back to where they were. And um, there's a, a bit of a modern Bailey here in that, you know, if you try to pin down academic researchers and say, you know, do you, you know, do you believe that there's unconscious mental life? Do you, and, and they use different words, right? They talk about implicit, they talk about implicit processes, which is a kind of a code word for unconscious. Mm-hmm. They won't use the word unconscious. They talk about procedural memory, right? You know, do you believe that judgment, decision processes, perception, motivation takes place unconsciously? Well, you know, they have to say yes, because science shows it, um, right? And that's the retreat to the, um, you know, to the Bailey, to the, to the tower. That's the defensible position. But then, you know, as soon as they're not being questioned or, you know, scrutinized again, then they move right back to, you know, advocating therapy in a way that actually allows no room for unconscious processes. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bait, of a bait and, and switch. And, or something. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a bait and switch, you know? Oh yeah, of course we believe this, but when push comes to shove and we talk about what we do in the therapy room, we don't believe it anymore. It's a kind of tyranny of the ego that just, moves into these institutions and then becomes a kind of ethos or a zeitgeist in the institution that people then perhaps feel frightened to challenge or be on the other side of. But you have stood on the far side of that. I'm definitely on the far side. (laughs) Right? The voice in the wilderness, man. You know, to give CBT and and non-analytic approaches to therapy their due, there has, in fact, been a trajectory, you know, over the last decades. <laughs> I mean, they won't, they won't describe it this way, but in fact, there's been a trajectory where they're getting more and more psychoanalytic. Now they invent new terminology and new words, right? We don't study un- unconscious processes, but we study implicit beliefs, mm-hmm. and we study schemas, and we pl- study implicit schemas, right? And, but I mean, mm-hmm. you know, implicit schemas is another word for um, a complex un- in Jungian terms. Yeah, un- you know, unconscious patterns and you know, sort of unconscious working models of what happens in relationships. So, you know, there's a, a, I mean, a kind of another sleight of hand is the people who are promoting these newer therapies, they call them third wave CBT as a truism, you know, they're very denigrating of, of psychoanalytic approaches. You mm-hmm. know, the scales have fallen, fallen from their eyes. You know, that was an old way. It's been debunked. Here's the new way. Right? And, you know, and they, they treat psychoanalytic therapies as a, as a, boogeyman or, you know, a foil, right, to, to, as a foil to use to compare their work with. Hmm. And so they simultaneously denigrate it, even as over time, they've actually incorporated more and more psychoanalytic ways of working. And this was part of your research that 
even as you examined the way CBT was being delivered in, in the consulting room, you began to collect evidence that what was actually helping people in those sessions was a very nuanced application of psychodynamic interaction and that the claimed intervention of the worksheet or the Likert scales may not at all have been the thing that was moving people. Let me allow, so first of all, you're, you're giving me way too much credit and people in general give me way too much credit for that, that paper. <laughs> so it, it actually wasn't my research. Every single thing in that paper was existing research. It was already published. The work was done by other people. Um, so it, it, wasn't, it wasn't really my research. What I did was pull diverse, you know, diverse research literatures together, mm -hmm. bring it all together in one place to, um, you know, to, to, to be able to tell a clear narrative about what we really know and what we don't know. So not, not my research. Um, the research you're thinking of was actually done by a colleague of mine, Enrico Jones, who was at the University of California, Berkeley. He, he passed away some years ago at a relatively young age. But what he did was really, it was really fascinating. So he had archival recordings, video recordings and transcripts of psychotherapy sessions that were you know, CBT sessions. And he had, he had recordings and transcripts of psychoanalytic therapy sessions. Right, so you can go back to the, the raw data. What's actually going on in the room between patient and therapist? Right? There, there's the theory, there's the model, there's what the, there's what the treatment manuals say, but that's not necessarily what's happening in the room. And he developed a, a coding system. He developed a, an instrument that was a hundred different things that might or might not be going on in the therapy sessions, right? So what kinds of interventions is the therapist using? Uh, what sorts of things are being discussed? How is the therapist approaching different things? Right? What are the patient and the therapist doing in the room? A hundred different things that you could, you know, the, that, you could use to, to describe systematically what's actually happening in the session. And so he did two things. They had hundreds of hours of these recorded sessions that were coded using this, this instrument. It's called the, the, the psychotherapy process QSORT. So we had, you know, real hard, concrete information about what was going on in the sessions. He took the same instrument and he asked a panel of world-class experts in psychoanalytic therapy to describe what, what should be going on in, a, in an ideal therapy session, right? So he got a kind of a template of what psychoanalytic or psychodynamic therapy is supposed to look like, according to the experts. He also got a panel of world-class experts in CBT and asked them to describe the ideal session and came up with a template for CBT. And the research question was, First of all, what are clinicians really doing and which way of working leads to better outcomes? And they had, you know, ob objective assessments of, of treatment outcomes. So they knew who was getting better and who wasn't. I, I was actually at, at Berkeley at the time and um, played a very, very small role in, 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 in his research. But um, before the findings came out, before we knew the answers, I actually had a prediction and it turned out to be dead wrong. And my prediction was, I thought that the psychodynamic therapist who adhered, adhered most closely to the psychodynamic model would have better outcomes. And I thought the CBT therapists who had adhered more closely to the CBT model would have better outcomes. And, and my reasoning was because they're more expert within yes, their approach. Yeah, I can see that. Right. But I was wrong. The finding actually was that adherence to the CBT model actually had no relation to outcome at all. It didn't do anything. And adherence to the psychodynamic model, in fact, was the stronger, was the predictor of good outcome. And it was the predictor of outcome not only in the for the not only for the therapists who are doing therapists and patients who are doing psychodynamic therapy, the psychodynamic, right, psychodynamic interventions predicted good outcome even among the therapists who are doing CBT. Right. So so what we learned from that research is when CBT therapists were effective, it wasn't because they were following their CBT treatment manuals. It was because they were departing from their manuals and they were doing the kinds of things that psychodynamic therapists do. And I can give you specific examples of that if, if you like. 
I would love to hear those examples. <laughs> so uh, this draws on research that was done by uh, one of Enrico Jones' protégés, uh, Stuart Ablon, who's now a you know important psychotherapy researcher in his own right. He went back to the original videotapes to try to find out what, what was really happening. You know, what what were the CBT therapists who were more effective and less effective actually doing? And it it looked something like this. So you know, in CBT homework assignments are, are kind of a big deal. They're very central to the therapy. The idea is the patient is going to practice, you know, practice skills. You know, anybody who's had CBT or anybody who's listening who's practiced CBT, being a CBT therapist, knows it's very, very common that, you know, that there'll be a homework assignment in the therapy and the patient will come back the next week and not have done it. Exactly. Now, what it says in the CBT manual is that it's important to you know educate or re-educate the patient that right they need to understand intellectually the rationale for the homework assignments why they're doing it um, you know how it's going to help them right so so the response if you follow the you know the CBT model is the response is we're going to give the patient information they must just not understand well enough you know why it's in their interest to do this so we're going to teach them again or you know reteach them like why this is a necessary part of the therapy. That's what the therapist did who had relatively unsuccessful outcomes. The CBT therapist who had the best outcomes did one or two things, one of two things. So one thing they would do is they would say, you know, we talked last week about this homework assignment. It seemed like we both agreed that, that this would be helpful to you. It seems like something got in the way <laughs> of being able to follow through with that. You know, I wonder if we could talk about that. I'm like, you know, like exploring part, the resistance. Exactly, exploring the defense and the resistance. Like, you know, part of you is on board and wanted to do that, but it seems that there's another part of you that you know has something else to say about it that we didn't hear from in words. We heard there from in action, in actions by not doing it. Right. So yeah, they were, even though they didn't call it that, what they were really doing was was analysis of defense and resistance. Or some of them would say, you know, you didn't do it. I wonder if it has something to do with with what's going on between you and me in our relationship. I wonder mm -hmm. if it has something to do with something that you're feeling about me or our work. So in other words, they were getting into discussion, exploration of transference. And for mm -hmm. listeners who you know don't know the term, transference means that we 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 bring in our, our patterns of our relationship patterns into the therapy relationship. And you know, we end up recreating these patterns with this new person, with the therapist. So, Jonathan, I, you know, I've got your paper in front of me, and I so enjoyed reading it. And I'm I'm wondering if you could just summarize sort of the main finding, which had to do with the effect size of psychodynamic psychotherapy. And you, you do a good job of sort of summarizing this, uh, this measure of effect size, yeah. and then bringing it forward in terms of these uh, meta meta reviews. It's a little technical, but... Um... I'm 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 all about taking complicated technical things and making them accessible. So mm -hmm. I'm glad. So so here's the problem when or I should say the challenge. You know when you do research, you know suppose you do it on something you know very very circumscribed, not not all therapy, but therapy specifically for depression, and your outcome measure is questionnaires or checklists about you know, improvement in your depression symptoms, right? So even if we look at something that circumscribed, you know, there's half a dozen or more depression, depression rating scales, or, you know, measuring approaches in use. Actually, there's a good deal more than half a dozen. So there's, there's quite a few, right? And, and so they're not measuring outcome the same way. They're not using the same metric. You know, if, if I say, you know, how tall are you? And you say you're five, six, say, everybody knows what five, six is, you know, and maybe if you're European, you know it in centimeters, but you can translate it into, you know, you can translate it, right? The problem is nobody knows what these measures mean, and they don't know how they compare. When you look at a research literature, the challenge is that you very quickly get into the business of, of trying to compare apples and oranges because everybody is using a different outcome measure mm -hmm. and it's not apparent whether or not they're getting consistent results, whether the results agree with each other. 
I may, actually, I should back up a little bit. You know, if we have one study and it shows, say, that this form of therapy is effective, right? That's a for, informative to a point. If we have a whole literature where we have many studies conducted by different people, different independent researchers, mm. and they all converge in showing that something is effective, well, that's far, far more informative. So we don't want to cherry pick individual studies because there's a lot of, the technical word is variance you know, in results. Mm -hmm. What we really want to do is look at the aggregate or the synthesis of findings across different studies. But then that's really hard to do because of the apples and oranges problem. So researchers developed a way to translate the results of different studies into common units, right? So that we're all using the same metric, the same, you know, yardstick of measurement, and that's called effect size. And so effect size is just a researchy statistician's way of making sure that we're talking about things in common units. And we have some kind of benchmarks, you know, what, what's a small effect size, what's a moderate effect size, what's a large effect size. So the effect sizes for psychotherapy in general are moderate to large. Mm. Okay? Um, you know, if you were to compare effect sizes for psychotherapy to effect sizes for a lot of common medical treatments or interventions, mm. right, actually psychotherapy is a pretty powerful intervention. It's more powerful than an awful lot of medical interventions that people never think twice about. We don't question, we take for granted. So, you know, the first thing is it, it's not true that, you know, talk is weak medicine. Talk is powerful medicine. Mm, that's that's the first that. message. Talk yeah. is powerful medicine. Talk is powerful. And that is objectively, that quantifiably, scientifically true. That, mm -hmm. that is a fact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we can make a big difference in somebody's life through talk. So once that's established, you know, is therapy effective? We can then, you know, ask some more specific refined questions like, you know, is this form of therapy effective? Is that form of therapy effective? How do they compare? And, you know, bird's eye view, take home message, the effect size for CBT, right? So this is looking, this isn't looking at, is your life getting better? This is looking only at, you know, are your symptoms of a particular DSM disorder improving, right? But, you know, the effect size is moderate to large, right? It, it's effective, at least in the short run, right? People, people benefit from it. But the effect size for psychodynamic therapies is every bit as large, slightly larger, actually, Mm -hmm. And, you know, this whole narrative that psychoanalytic approaches have been debunked and CBT is superior is just flat out untrue, right? These are alternative facts, <laughs> as I think mm -hmm. we call them nowadays, right? Psychodynamic therapy is every bit as effective as CBT. The issue should have been laid to rest. There's multiple studies, minus one of a number of studies that, you know, all of which lay this issue to rest. And yet this alternative, these alternative facts, this, this false narrative continues. CBT is superior. It's proven. It's, the it's tested. Standard. It's the gold standard. Yeah, that's, that's what that's I hear BS. all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you hear. And, and the reason you hear it is because nobody is willing to make it concrete and say, well, if it's the gold standard, what actually is the effect size? Right. So effect size, is just, it's, it's, just again, because it's, you know, it's a technical term. It is a measure of how much benefit the average person gets from therapy expressed in, in kind of standard units, right? People say it's evidence-based, it's the gold standard, it's best practices. And this word salad, all these terms take the place of, of being really concrete and scientific and objective and saying, well, what is the effect size for CBT? Tell me the number. And what is the effect size for psychodynamic therapy? And right, all of these claims you're making about how it's the gold standard, we would expect this, the effect size for CBT must be much, much larger than psychodynamic therapy. It's flat out untrue. Right? The effect size for psychodynamic therapy is, is as large, every bit as large as the effect size for CBT. So this entire narrative rests on a falsehood. But, okay, just one, one question to challenge you, because as you pointed out, a lot of the manualized therapies are short term. So if you can get the same effect size after eight to 12 sessions, why, why would anyone come to one of us and 
see us for, you know, 50, 100, 150, 200 sessions. Well, that's actually a great same question. Effect size. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So, so that's another part of the myth in this narrative. CBT is an eight to 12 sessions in the real world. That's nonsense, right? So what we have is research studies conducted under completely artificial conditions, right? In, in the real world, patients come to us because they're suffering, you know, they're in distress, or they recognize that they're repeating painful self-defeating patterns or tripping over their own feet. We get involved in trying to get to know the person and understand what's behind their problems. And the therapy takes as long as it takes. And, and I can give you some numbers about how long that is for, for most people. Anyway, right, therapy in the real world goes on until the patients get better. That's not how these research studies are done, right? They're not, the, the, researchers, the researchers aren't beginning with the question, you know, let's, let's track these patients over time and see how long it takes before, you know, say the majority of them, 50% of the patients show a meaningful improvement. That's not how they're doing it. They're, they're doing it in some artificial parallel universe where they say before the study even begins, you know, this is a treatment of eight session duration or 12 session dura duration. And, and those are the most common durations for, for these manualized so-called evidence-based therapies. And, and then the therapy stops, whether the patient is better or not, whether the patient thinks they're better or not, whether the patient is satisfied with their experience, it, it, it just stops. And then they report results based on eight to 12 sessions. You know, they show a, a, a difference between a treatment and a control group, which is not the question that patients or clinicians give a damn about. We don't care if it's slightly better than a control group or statistically significant, significantly better than a control group. What we care about is, is the person well? Is their life better as a result? It's a completely different question. Anyway, so they do these eight to 12 session manualized therapies and they declare it to be the gold standard. But in the real world, and this is true for CBT therapists, experienced CBT therapists, in the real world, CB treat, CBT treatments are much longer. Hmm. We actually know from surveys of, of patients and clinicians both how long CBT and psychodynamic treatments tend to take. They're actually very comparable. So this is like this myth that it's like CBT is a magic bullet and it, and it happens in eight, eight sessions. I mean, I mean, think about that, the, the absurdity of it. I mean, problems, psychological problems that, you know, that somebody is that have been lifelong don't magically disappear in a matter of weeks. It just contradicts everything we know about human psychology. Not, not to, you know, it just contradicts everything we know scientifically about human psychology. And it contradicts everybody's observations and common sense. You know, people's character doesn't change in a matter of weeks. And that's what we're after. Right? So in the real world, psychodynamic therapy and CBT are actually quite comparable. In length. Mm -hmm. The second thing is most of these studies that um, in, in the studies that I describe in, in my paper, these are not long-term open-ended multi-year therapies. I mean, most of these therapies are a year or less. Right? So the benefits are happening within a reasonable time frame, and, that, mm -hmm. and that's, true for, that's true for psychodynamic therapy and it's true for CBT as conducted in the real world. Mm -hmm. This idea of eight to 12 session cures is a myth. The health insurance industry has pounced on it, yep. right? Because it's in their economic interest. If we can, you know, if we can pay for less and tell you that you've had, you know, you've had the treatment you're entitled to, that's, that's what we're going to do because it's profitable. Mm -hmm. So one answer to the question, why should I be involved in a longer term therapy if I can get the same benefits in, you know, eight weeks, you can't get the same benefits in eight weeks. Mm -hmm. That. We know scientifically. The second thing is we really have to think hard about what we mean by benefits. Because if you mean, you know, alleviation of symptoms, right, that might happen relatively quickly. If you mean becoming a more whole person, freeing yourself from self-defeating, counterproductive life patterns, relationship patterns, right? If we're talking about living your life more fully and creatively, right? That's a very different outcome. And our research doesn't address those outcomes. So what most people want from therapy is not actually what the researchers are measuring. So when they say we can get these results in eight or 12 weeks, <laughs> two points, keep in mind, 
the results they're talking about are not the results that most patients and clinicians are after. And secondly, it's not happening in eight or 12 weeks. You know, I, I want to just pick up on one more thing uh, from from the paper, and that that's this extraordinary finding that that surfaced multiple times from my understanding, which is that patients who had psychodynamic psychotherapy did better at follow-up and then continued to even get better beyond that so that when you check back in with them six months or a year later, they, they were even better yeah. than when they finished yeah, Lisa, treatment. Lisa, you are asking great questions. So, <laughs> right, this, so this, is, this is really important. Yeah. The way these research studies are typically done, right, the, the patients come into treatment for eight sessions or 12 sessions, and then they measure the outcome, meaning symptom improvement, on the day therapy ends. Well, who gives a damn what you look like on the day therapy ends? What we really ought to be, what we should care about is, you know, how is your life going forward, right? Not are you better on the day therapy ends, but you know, are you well, however we want to define well, and do you stay well? And, you know, this is a dirty little secret in evidence-based therapy research that when you measure outcome on the day therapy ends, you, you know, you see an improvement in the sense that there's a difference between a treatment group and a control group that doesn't get any treatment, but the patients start relapsing. Even the patients who improve start relapsing very, very quickly. So, you know, by six months, and then these are, these are empirical findings, you know, within six months to a year, the majority of the patients are looking for treatment again for the very same problem, right? That ought to make us stop and take pause. By a year out, very few of these studies actually even bother to look at outcomes, you know, going forward after a time interval, they just stop on the day therapy ends. But, you know, in studies that do have follow-up periods, six months, 12 months out, you know, by a year out, the differences between the treatment and the control groups are, are no longer detectable. There are no mm. lasting benefits. Wow. Right? And that, I mean, there's quite a lot of research on that. And, and um, what's really fascinating is the pattern is different for psychoanalytic therapies mm. that not only do the patients maintain their gains, you know, months after the treatment, years after the treatment, but it looks like the gains actually increase over time. Oh. So what that means is to me, you know, we're not just trying to manage or alleviate symptoms in the short run. We're trying to shift something fundamental about the person's mm. psychology, mm -hmm. right? That will make a difference in their life going forward. So, so I believe that the benefits of, you know, really meaningful, effective therapy, you know, actually accrue and grow over time because we're living our lives differently. And um, a colleague of mine who wrote a wonderful book, Mary Jo Peebles, she wrote a book called Beginnings, The Art and Science of Planning Psychotherapy. And in her book, she has this wonderful analogy. And she says, you know, it's like a ship leaving port, setting sail. And, you know, we're going to just maybe change your heading by, you know, three degrees. Oh, that's great. And if we look at your outcome, you know, where is the ship, you know, when they're like 500 yards out of port, you know, three degrees change doesn't change a damn thing. The ships are basically in the same place, right? But, you know, by the time you sail halfway across the globe, by the time you sail, you know, some long distance, you know, it could be the difference between going to Siberia or going to Hawaii. So, you know, <laughs> and what I would much rather go to Hawaii. Yeah, we would. Rather, <laughs> right? So, you know, think about therapy. If you think about therapy like that, this idea that we're going to measure your outcome after, you know, the with a questionnaire after eight weeks or 12 weeks or 16 weeks, it, it really doesn't fit what therapists and patients are trying to do. Jonathan, I'd like to just take a little uh, pivot and uh, back to you personally. I'm really inspired by the stance that you are taking both in academia and in the collective, really speaking these truths, being a bit of a lightning rod because there is a resistance in the collective around this. I'm sure that you weren't a young boy imagining that your destiny was to be a lightning rod. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. That's correct. So I'm wondering, how has your personality changed such that you can tolerate 
carrying this message into the collective and tolerate the heat. Yeah, I don't know that it has changed because I've, you know, <laughs> I mean, going at least back to graduate school, you know, I really tried to complete two completely different curriculum curricula at the same time. I, I mean, I was a researcher. I was in the research track. I published empirical papers and, you know, experimental personality and social psychology. Mm -hmm. But I was also immersed in the, the clinical training. And I you know I was very aware from the very beginning. It was like I was trying to function in two different parallel universes. And, you know, actually, I at the time, I never really was accepted as one of us, certainly not in the in the clinical world, you know, I was always that ac academic researcher interloper. What was I doing there? And, and the further I went along this course, <laughs> you, know, like, you know, it's, it's been a kind of strange road because, you know, I, I I've published as much or more empirical peer reviewed papers, you know, a, a, as most straight academic, you know, academic researchers mm -hmm. made it at, at this stage of my career, I've published in the top scientific journals in psychology and psychiatry, both, right? So I'm, I'm a legit, you know, card carrying researcher by citation count and, uh, you know, and all the ind indexes that, that, you know, we use to sort of measure impact as an academic. And yet I'm not really one of us, you know, because mm. I'm seen as psychoanalytic because I actually treat patients and do real clinical work you know, I'm like suspect. I'm, I'm the outsider. I'm the clinician. I'm the psychoanalyst. Well, you know, that's fine. But then in the psychoanalytic world, until fairly recently, I was also the outsider. I'm the researcher. I'm the interloper. Not really one of us there either. So I, I, I guess I got accustomed pretty early in my career to, um, you know, to living in, in a kind of a no man's land between two different worlds, you know, and really having access to both but not really fully, you know, not, not really fully belonging to either one. So in some ways it's a familiar position for me, but you know, you asked a question at the beginning and I'm realizing I didn't answer it. You asked me what, what led me to write this paper and you know, two things. One was because, you know, I occupied this, this sort of strange position straddling the academic research world and the clinical world. You know, I was very aware of of the just the the, the mismatch, right? the incongruities between what we believed and thought in one world and what we believed and thought in another world. It was like, you know, it was like there are two parallel universes that had nothing to do with each other, which from my way of thinking was absurd. We live in one universe, you know. <laughs> I mean, what's true has got to be true across the board. It, it, you know, we don't have one set of truths when we're doing research and a completely different unrelated set of truths when we're doing psychotherapy. Something is wrong here, right? So I, I was living that tension from the very beginning. The real catalyst, though, so I, I took a position as a faculty member at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I became an attending doctor in the outpatient psychiatry clinic. So it's a, a major medical center. Most of the patients who were coming there, I mean, most of them were on or had been on different psychiatric medications. A great many of them had had therapy. And since, you know, medical and evidence-based and scientific, you know, a great many of them had had so-called evidence-based therapies, right? Manualized worksheet, <laughs> scientifically mm -hmm. tested therapies that are supposed to be the gold standard. And day in and day out, I saw one patient after another, after another, after another, who had had these therapies and had absolutely nothing to show for it. They were no better off than they were before they started. I saw thousands, I, you know, over the years that I was there, thousands of patients who fit that description. And, you know, so I became very acutely aware that there is a big chasm between the rhetoric, gold standard, proven, scientifically mm. tested, you know, best practices, evidence-based, and the reality that I and my colleagues were seeing on the ground. It was like an open secret. Everybody knew that the patients weren't benefiting from these therapies. It's why they weren't in treatment and coming back for treatment for years on end. Right? And, you know, it, it just, I got to where I felt like somebody, you know, somebody has to call this out and say what's going on. 
It seems so cruel to tell a suffering person, this is going to help you, when you know it to be dishonest at some level. Well, I think the academic researchers, you know, so one thing you have to understand, we talked about this a little before we started recording, is there's a real bifurcation in the field uh, between academic researchers and clinical practitioners. They operate it. They're not the same people. See that the public cures psychologist and they think, or psychiatrist for that matter, and they think, oh, well, these are doctors. I see patients. They do therapy. And, you know, they don't. I mean, most most I mean, academic psychologists, by and large, don't treat patients. They've never treated a patient in their lives. You know, they're, they're, there's a handful who have. But most of the people who are publishing, actively publishing research are not clinicians. They're not trained to be clinicians. They have no experience being clinicians, right? So they're doing research about something that they don't actually do. And, you know, looking at it through a, you know, research lens where you're not actually getting to know the patients and finding out what's going on with them, I, I think it's easy to, you know, kind of drink your own Kool-Aid. So I don't think it's, I don't think they're necessarily dishonest. I, I, I think, I think they are in a silo mm -hmm. where they don't really have access to the information that they would have if they were getting to know people in a meaningful way and, you know, part of their lives in the way that therapists are. So, you know, I, I, I think, I think rather than blaming dishonesty, there's some of that too, but I, I think it's a system that silos mm -hmm. clinical practice and, and research yeah. and, and really, you know, really limits or prevents communication between these silos. So that raises an, an interesting question, which is how did the field of psychotherapy get captured by this other model? What's your understanding of how that happened? It's a very complicated issue. Um, we could devote an entire episode to, to that alone, <laughs> and that would barely scratch the surface. You know, so for one thing, there was a time when psychoanalysis was, you know, the game in town. And psychologists were excluded from training. Social workers were excluded from training. Actually, everyone was excluded from training except MDs. So psychoanalysis, at least in America, it was different in other countries, was owned by a medical establishment. And back then, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, post-World War II and, you know, in the 1940s, 1950s, into the 1960s maybe, you know, medicine was different too. It was very paternalistic, authoritarian, hierarchical, you know, the doctor knows best. And there was a way that psychoanalysis became contaminated by that. It became very within, you know, mainstream American psychoanalysis, it was perceived not entirely incorrectly as elitist, exclusionary, arrogant, right? And there were quite a lot of academic researchers, academic psychologists who were drawn to psychoanalysis, fascinated by it, you know, including people who had, you know, their version of the experience I had with the dream interpretation. And they were denied psychoanalytic training. So the psychoanalytic establishment pissed off generations of academic psychologists. And it left, you know, a lot of bad blood. And the psychoanalytic world is transformed. I mean, today's psychoanalysis isn't your great grandfather's psychoanalysis, you know, but the, the animosity remains. The other thing that psychoanalysis did that shot itself in the foot was that early on it was you know, kind of contemptuous about research. Well, academic researchers, psychologists, come out of a tradition of experimental psychology. It's a different tradition. And at the center of that tradition is science, objective measurement, studying things experimentally. And of course, they wanted to study psychoanalysis experimentally, and they did, actually. But establishment psychoanalysts ignored their research. They couldn't care less. They were dismissive mm -hmm. and contemptuous. Well, you could see how that alienated a lot of psychoanal a lot of academic psychologists. So, um, you know, and, and that's only, I mean, that's just a tip of the iceberg. That's one explanation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what happened is it, it created an atmosphere in, in academic psychology. You know, when studies came out about a new form of therapy that was rooted in research, you know, that was interested in measurement quantifiability and accountability, academic psychology embraced it, talked about it, disseminated the research, you know, 
right? It got a lot of attention. Psycho, uh, uh, academic psychologists were just delighted to, you know, to promote and disseminate this research. Meanwhile, very quietly, there were pretty good sized group of psychoanalytically oriented psycho scientific researchers who were po- quietly publishing studies, you know, demonstra- testing and demonstrating the value of psychoanalytic concepts and psychoanalytic treatments. And this research was ignored. And, mm. you know, just to put my con- my paper in context, by the time I wrote my paper in 2010, quite a lot of this research had accumulated. It was scattered across different literatures, right? It wasn't all in one place. And even though some of it was published in, you know, top tier journals, you know, this, these weren't published in, you know, B level journals. These were published in, you know, the, the best scientific journals we have. It was ignored. It wasn't cited. It was disregarded, right? So we had all this research that existed and nobody knew about it. And, and I should say, just to be an equal opportunity, you know, critic, Nobody knew about it in the academic world because of their biases and prejudice against you know what they thought was you know what they thought was psychoanalytic concepts and treatment, and very few people knew about it in the psychoanalytic world because of their biases and prejudices against right. ac- against, against empirical research. research. Yes, yeah. So what I did was pull all the work together. And, you know, the paper was kind of a unicorn. The American Psychological Association, which is the publisher of the paper that I wrote, I published it in, this was the flagship journal of psychology. This is, you know, the the most, you know, the most visible, the most visible psychology journal that goes not just to psychologists specializing in one or another subfield. This This is the only journal that goes to everybody, all the members of the American Psychological Association. And they did not want to publish this paper. I could tell you stories about what it took to get this, this published. But anyway, it was the right journal because it brought it to the attention of clinicians and researchers at the same time. And you know, all of a sudden, all of this research that had been around for a while, it was now on the map. You, know, you couldn't ignore it. I want to kind of bring us right up to the present day and ask you about something that I'm seeing. So I'm talking to people in uh, training programs, whether that's PhD psychology programs or master's level uh, training programs for psychotherapists. And I'm hearing an awful lot about the emphasis on uh, social justice. And uh, although, of course, that's that's a really important uh, area, it seems like it's seeping into uh, clinical work more and more when there might be a rationale for keeping those things separate, at least some of the time. And I, I wonder if you're seeing that too, and if you have any thoughts about that. Let me try to offer a kind of a balanced perspective. You know, so historically in psychiatry, we tend to think of the individual as you know, the unit of study. And you know, we see somebody and they're having problems, and you know, it, it's because they have this or that psychiatric disorder. Right? And that's what we treat. You know, but of course, people exist in systems. We exist in relationship systems, in family systems, in community systems, you know, in cultural systems. So, you know, in one way, there's an important and useful corrective for, for something that was amiss previously, which is I, th- I think we really need to understand the interplay of, you know, the individual and the collective. Mm-hmm. I mean, when people are living in a culture that, you know, when when something in the culture is broken, people are living in, you know, struggling to support themselves. People are trying to raise children and, you know, their work life is structured in a way that there's no acknowledgement that, you know, that requires time and energy and investment. You know, when we have people bumping up against against societal systems that really weren't designed with the interests of human beings in mind, Mm -hmm. well, of course, we're going to see a whole range of different kinds of problems. And it's really important to think about not just the person, but the system and the society that's giving rise to it. So in that sense, right? Thinking about social justice is incredibly valuable. Yes, you know, it's I agree. A, it's a fact that there are inequities in society that, um, you know, that that 
certain marginalized groups in society are discriminated against, you know, have less opportunity, get the short end of the stick, right? Right. I mean, we know that. So in one sense, it's positive that psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, therapists, we're, we're thinking about this in ways that we didn't a generation ago. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like most things, I mean, you know, one of the things we, we psychoanalysts understand, you, you know, is that everything has, you know, I mean, everything has the potential for good and everything has the potential for harm. You know, everything has a shadow side. Mm-hmm. And the shadow side here is, you know, and I'm not, I'm not taking a political stance here. I'm just, just describing what I see, right? you mm-hmm. know, that I see more and more therapists coming out of graduate programs and they don't really know how to think psychologically. Yeah, that's about that's my, their my patient's observation problems, too. Yeah. Right. That they only have a lens, mm-hmm. right, of social systems and cultural systems and you know, systems of power and oppression. Mm-hmm. They see the patients or their clients' problems, you know, almost exclusively, you know, in terms of, you know, social and cultural factors. And they don't actually know what to do to help the person. Right. And, you know, this came up with a supervisee of mine recently. She was, um, she was actually talking about some colleagues of hers who had gone to graduate school with her, and she came from a program that was, you know, had been, you know, had been large, very captured by this kind of this social justice ideology. The practical effect of it in the therapy room was she was describing, you know, classmates and colleagues. They get in the room with the patient. They identify the systems of oppression out there in the world, and then they kind of throw their hands up in you know helplessness and frustration because they don't know how to help the person. So you know the shadow side of this is, you know, if it helps us to think about the interplay between the individual and the culture and social systems, then it's offering something very helpful in our way of thinking and working. If it supplants and takes the place of being able to understand, you know, understand somebody's emotional life, mental life, psychological struggles, and we lose that as a way of thinking and under, we lose that as a skill, you know, then actually what we have is a generation of therapists who are trained to be very good activists, but not very good psychotherapists. You know, and I I hate to say it, I'm going to get... I'm going to get hate mail and you know I'm probably going to be canceled for saying this on the on the podcast but you know if if psychoanalytic therapy is about anything it's about speaking the truth as best we understand it mm. and you know I can't tell you how many people I, I do a lot of clinical supervision so tra- for people listening who don't know training in in psychotherapy is largely I mean, it's largely an apprenticeship model. You get your, you know, your classrooms and your books yes. and your reading, but the, the, you know, the real action happens. You know, the trainee discusses their cases and their work with a the supervisor. They go over the details of individual cases. It's kind of an apprentice model. I can't tell you how many therapists who are trained in this, this, this these kinds of programs, you know, come out. They come out just, you know, just fired up. They are going to you know, change the world and help people, right? Because people go into this field with, you know, mostly good. I mean, we know, we know people have power of two minds and, and multiple motives about everything, but mostly people go in with good intentions. They want to help people. They want to help alleviate suffering, right? So they come out just, you know, fired up about what they think they can do in their clinical work. They go into clinical practice and, you know, maybe five years down the road, they kind of wake up to, I don't know how to help people mm. who are with mm-hmm. the kinds of problems that they're bringing to me. I can't tell you how many of those therapists are approaching me for supervision and really saying, you know, I want to be a better clinician. I never learned how to do this work. And unfortunately, we live in such a polarized society. You know, as soon as you say one thing, you know, there 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 are people who just want to put you in a box, you know, you're pro this or you're anti that. You know, and there's not a whole lot of room right, for nuanced thought 
you know, you're, you're, <laughs> I mean, life is complex. The world is complex. Mental life is complex. Things just don't reduce to some simple one dimensional narrative, right? So that's my fear about talking about this on the air. <laughs> you know, someone will pluck a sentence out of context and mm -hmm. all of a sudden I'm in a box and I'm the bad guy to a sizable group of people. So in my apprenticeship, I worked in, on an inpatient psychiatric unit for part of it. And there was a woman there who lived in a kind of notorious housing project in the Bronx. And she was, um, she was I think, from the Dominican Republic. And she was on an inpatient unit because she was uh, psychotic, had psychotic symptoms. And I remember we had a team meeting with her. And, you know, I was in there with the psychiatrists and the senior this and the senior that. And then there's little old me. I'm a social work intern, right? So I'm by far the lowest person on the totem pole in the room. And they were they were trying to really lean on her to take her medication. And she wanted to say, you know, okay, but I'm really worried about the the drug gangs and the housing unit. And I'm I'm worried that I could get killed by a straight bullet. I'm worried my son is gonna get in, you know, wrapped up in these gangs yeah. and that he'll get killed. And I'm, I'm thinking, if you're you know, living in impossible circumstances that are not fit for a human being to live in, let right. alone thrive in, how are you going to fix that with a pill? Right. right. And I'm thinking, you know, these concerns to me don't actually sound psychotic. Now, I, I'm sure there was a little more going on, but it, it was astounding because the team was telling her, well, you know, just don't worry about that. Just take your medication. And I was like, well, you know, as, as the social worker in the room, I was thinking, I wish I'd had the gumption at that point to say, whoa, you know, what are we doing here? But I, I just, I was too junior. I didn't have the authority or the gravitas to say it, but it, it was exactly this thing that our field gets uh, criticized for that, that we were focusing too much on this, on the, the individual and locating the problem in the individual rather than seeing that there was a very legitimate thing happening at the yeah. sort of um, systematic level or systemic level. Yeah, I agree. I agree completely. And that has been, you know, that has been a failing, you know, certainly of the psychiatric establishment and in a different way, maybe because, you know, now that the field of psychology has been taken over by, you know, evidence-based manualized therapies, they're making the same mistake. Right? The problem mm -hmm. is the individual and their diagnosis. So, you know, the, this work that we do is precious and it's delicate. <laughs> it, it, it's easy for it to be broken or corrupted or, you know, or the space, this sort of precious sacred space where we do this work. It's very easy for that space to be encroached mm. on and, and collapse. Right? What we're in the business of, of doing is thinking, understanding meanings, every level, every dimension of meanings. Right? We're not about Here's the simple, most obvious surface answer. We're about thinking deeply about the problems. And all of these fields are kind of easily corrupted in different ways. So let me go back. You said the biopsychosocial model, which comes from psychiatry, right? But you know, you, you said it just right. The corruption is right, biopsychosocial model is, is kind of an ideal. What we see in the real world is in practice in psychiatry, biopsychosocial laws you know, just often collapses, you know, to mean bio only, mm -hmm. right? And the treatment mm -hmm. is of medication and that's that. And I taught and worked in, you know, a university hospital-based psychiatric clinic. And I can tell you that, that that's going on. Biopsychosocial, yeah. you know, in theory or as an ideal and bio, bio, bio in practice, right? In psychology or other areas of psychotherapy, sometimes the bio gets left out sometimes the mm -hmm. social gets left out and the cultural. So the life of the mind is complex and nuanced and expediency. It's expedient to write a prescription. It's expedient to send someone off for eight sessions of CBT. I mean, expedience is the enemy of mm -hmm, mm -hmm. this, you know, sort of precious sacred work that we're trying to do. And, you know, when people are discussing complex issues with sound bites, which is what often happens, you know, a, a sort of a nuanced, you know, nuanced and complex understanding of you know, our, our human and our psychological situation 
is very quickly lost. So I feel like we're continually fighting, you know, <laughs> against collapsing, you know, collapsing our, our, our space for nuance and, and you know, a more complex understanding of things. I think you've summed that up in a really beautiful way that human beings can't be boiled down to a, a sheet that they fill out between sessions or a list of three Likert scale considerations that we are mysterious and that we are a constantly evolving system and parts of which we can never understand, but we can just catch a glimpse of and hope that that enhances our lives. And I appreciate so much about the voice that you're carrying, not just in your own academic world, but on behalf of um, analytic practicing psychotherapists who may not know how to speak into that world or even how to collect enough evidence to be able to debate on behalf of these principles. And uh, I'm just left here in the interview feeling very grateful yeah. for the work that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's exactly where I was going to go. I was going to say thank you so much for this important light that you're shining. I, I, I'm, I'm so pleased that we could bring it to our audience because I think that this is just so critical and, and very close to my heart, this, this subject. So we appreciate the work you're doing and we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th and sales have been strong and I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. That's wonderful. Yeah, I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. Today's dream comes from a 28-year-old woman who works as a waitress. And here's the dream. I am in a snowy place with my mom. We are leaving one chalet to go to a different one to meet up with other family members. While packing up to leave, I am preoccupied with a lost sweater. My mom is angry at me for wasting time. I love the sweater. It's beautiful and I wanted it for a long time before I got it. I gradually accept that the sweater is now gone, but I'm really sad about it. Then we get into the car. We are both in the back seat of the car talking to each other, and it takes a few minutes before we realize that the car is driving itself. I am not bothered by this. I seem to intuit that the car will take us to the right place, or at least that it knows where it's going. But my mom is once again angry at me for not driving it. I cannot drive it because my leg is injured. It is this anger, as she realizes that I'm not driving the car, that seems to make the car stop, and then we are stranded in the middle of the road. For context, she notes, I recently broke my right kneecap at work, so I cannot drive anywhere, and the work injury has made me determined to find a different job where I will not encounter so much bodily risk. The main feelings in the dream were, 
bereft, isolated, bewildered, and sad. And she notes, I live with my mom and have for a couple of years. Living at home with my mom helped me survive the pandemic, but I've been feeling increasingly suffocated, stifled, and dominated there. She wants me to live a life that I don't want for myself, and she judges and shames me, sometimes cruelly, when I don't do what she wants. There is no other way to save my soul life. I must get out. I must become independent. But I am literally and financially immobilized because of my leg injury and attendant loss of income. So we are in the realm of the mother complex, for sure, and the development from the puella into the independent and empowered feminine. Yes, this is a dream that illustrates a lot of important things about dreams. And, and I, I think I want to start with reminding us that a dream is always going to tell us something we don't already know. So I think some of what this dream shows uh, is probably known to the dreamer, but the dream offers it up in a very clear uh, psychologically illuminating series of images. So it, it probably clarifies a situation that the dreamer may have already been somewhat aware of. Right off the bat, she's in a snowy place with mom. So that may tell us something about the nature of the mother complex, the nature of the relationship with actual outer world mom, that there's something cold about it. And that she's longing for a sweater. Ideally, it's something that's beautiful, but also warm or warming. So it seems like there's this attempt in the psyche to try to manage the coldness of the mother complex, or maybe historically there was. And this self-soothing image of the sweater has somehow been lost. And needs to be mourned. In a and way. needs to be mourned. Yeah, but so you know, we might we might think about a sweater as a um, you know a way to guard against the cold, but it doesn't solve the problem of coldness. So it may be that there's been some way to cope with this coldness before that's no longer available. I would be curious to know if this is an actual sweater that the dreamer owns or has owned, or whether it's just. A, a general kind of dream sweater, because I think that would make a little bit of difference. If it were an actual sweater, I'd be very interested in the associations and what more detail that could tell us about what may be a defense against coldness. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering if the sweater in some very mysterious way is a metaphor for her own bodily autonomy mm. because she's she's injured her kneecap and she can't ambulate so she's put into this cold environment without being able to act with the same amount of agency she would before so the loss of the sweater makes her vulnerable to the mother's coldness and her anger the loss of her ability to walk and work has also made her vulnerable to the mother's coldness and uh, loss of autonomy because the car has to drive her. Mm -hmm. It seems like such a stretch in terms of imagery, but in terms of the effect on her, it, I wonder if there's a secret connection in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you that what really leaps out to me as something different and surprising in this dream is the fact that the car is driving itself. And sometimes there's a little element in a dream that really calls attention to itself in this way. And you can always bet that it's important. So here's what I think about this car driving itself is the mother is very angry that the dreamer is not driving the car. And uh, we can see from this dream the role that the mother plays in this dreamer's psyche and, and, and in her associations that, uh, you know, in, in, her, in her outer life, her mother can be cruel and shaming and uh, wants a life for this dreamer that the dreamer doesn't want for herself. So clearly there's a, a negative mother complex here, a negative relationship with this mother. 
But in the realm of the psyche, things are always paradoxical, just like the witch in the fairy tale that wants to uh, kill and eat Hansel and Gretel is also the keeper of great wealth and riches that the children can access once they've vanquished her or once they've learned to confront her. I wonder where the riches are that this mother offers. And to me, this is somewhere in this realm of her being angry that the dreamer's not driving it. Because as you pointed out, Joseph, this image of not driving the car is an image of forsworn agency. Now, in real life, this dreamer can't currently drive. But I do wonder in her life in general, if she's been a bit passive. And her mother may want her to to live a life that the dreamer doesn't want, but the mother may also be pressuring the dreamer to get on with things and get in the driver's seat of life. Well, as you were talking, Lisa, I had this image of the mother bear driving her cub up to the top of a tree and then ambling off into the forest when it's time for the cub to separate from the mother. And then the bear cubs will bleat until they realize that mom's not coming back again Mm. and crawl down the tree and start their own autonomous lives. So if I think of the mother as kind of a, a mother bear cuffing her, so to speak, to get her in motion, we can imagine that that doesn't feel particularly elegant, but it also may be, as you were saying, what's required Mm -hmm. Because she's lived with her mother for several years, several years prior to the injury to her knee. So living in a kind of overly dependent or provisional life is something that she's been struggling with. And I suspect on some level of her own self is wishing for something different, better, unique. When she says in the context that, I must get out. I must become independent. I had the feeling that that's something she has said to herself many times. Mm. So what's going to bring it to crisis now so that she can sacrifice some image of herself or belief about herself that inhibits her from moving into a state of independence and power? Hmm. Yeah, it's almost uh, seems possible that the injury could be what really provokes the change. You know, now her her loss of agency has been kind of enacted on her body, and that she she can't mm-hmm. she can't work, she can't drive, and that this may be the thing that really draws attention to her dilemma. Joseph, I love the image of the mother bears. I didn't realize that that was something that happens. But it does bring up that if the mother if the, the mother is too good, then it makes it difficult ever to separate from her. Mm-hmm. So when a young adult is getting ready to separate, oftentimes there's a lot of tension. You know, the mom gets, you know, irritated easily at the young adult, and the young adult may feel really oppressed and put upon. And in some sense, it's like the mother chasing the bear up the tree. It's, it's, it's what must happen. And sometimes we need to kind of find our anger and irritation at one another to make that easier. I'm also curious about where the masculine principle is. She talks about living with her mother, and the absence of living with a mother and father is a little bit apparent in the description. I'm also wondering if the self-driving car is a strangely mechanical image of the masculine, that it's a kind of magical car that provides a kind of agency, but whoever the driver is, is invisible in some way. So I'm having a fantasy right now. Again, it's, of course, very speculative that As the masculine begins to subtly constellate, even in a somewhat magical way, the mother's negativity towards the masculine interrupts, 
its ability to take them forward. And the mother wants to push the daughter into the driver's seat, perhaps because of her own marginalization by the masculine or perhaps even the patriarchy. Hmm. So I'm wondering whether the mother is ambivalent also about agency and access to animus. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such a a rich image to unpack. Uh, and and you know what what you said brought up for me, I think you know, you raised this really good point about okay, wait a minute, the car has agency. It's almost like where this dreamer's life is going is kind of an automatic pilot or there's something mechanical about it. You know, the car is just taking them somewhere. And then, of course, you know, it's also really interesting that it's the mother's anger that makes the car stop. Mm-hmm. Because there, there is this way that when we're locked into a conflict like this with our parent, and we haven't fully taken responsibility for our lives, the fact that the parent wants us to do something almost ensures that we can't or won't do it. It's almost like a, a, an unconscious protest that we make. So that was my fantasy about this car stopping with the mother's anger, that the mother pushing her daughter to do certain things is actually making the daughter feel more stuck. I'm, just, I'm really sitting with that. The, the anger as the mother complex realizes that the ego's not driving the car, makes the car stop, and leaves her stranded in the road, And in her context later on, she also gives us that feeling that she's stranded in the road. Yes, I mean, the car is also perhaps a metaphor for her body. The car's not Mm. running, her body's not running. So there's a little bit of that. But on a deeper level, I really resonate with what you're saying. There's something about anger or an atmosphere of hostility that can really stymie somebody's adventurousness or stymie her confidence in herself to even take a risk and perhaps make a mistake. Yes. And if she were to make a mistake, to feel that her parent would be there to provide support or advice or some kind of a safe space to regroup. I I think it's two things. I think it's what you just said, that an atmosphere of anger or hostility can really take the wind out of our sails. Absolutely. And I think it's also true that when there's a kind of enmeshment, as there may be here, when mom is very invested in getting a particular outcome in a child, very often what that teen or young adult will do is do exactly the opposite of want uh, of what mom wants and and you can just use your imagination on how I might have any insight into this. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I find that I'm too attached to particular outcomes for my kids, that is almost certainly going to mean that they go in the opposite direction. So there's a need to kind of unhook a little bit psychologically. So, and, and the fact that they're in the backseat together does point to a kind of enmeshment. An enmeshment and also a similarity. Mm-hmm. That as much as the, the mother complex is pushing her to drive the car, the mother is also content to be in the backseat. Mm-hmm. Yes. So the mother complex is also modeling yes. a certain attitude that the daughter's aligned with. And also wanting the daughter to carry something that the yep. mother is not carrying. Yeah, so he, that's very astute, Joseph, and it goes back to what you were saying before about perhaps the mother's relationship with agency. And to what extent is the daughter carrying the unlived life of the mother here? Is the daughter being expected to to move forward, as she said, again, in the context, in a particular direction, to satisfy the mother's fantasies. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't want to live her mother's life, but also doesn't feel like she can take hold of her own life, perhaps also because her own map may not be clear yet. Mm -hmm. And that's also suggested with the car that's driving based on its own kind of secret intelligence, but nobody kind of knows where it's going. Mm -hmm. I also just want to mention that the dreamer is 28 years old. We've mentioned this before, but, For those who are interested in astrology, 
28 is your first major Saturn return. And for many people, right around that transition from late 20s to early 30s tends to be a time of great change that's often brought about through a, a burst of internal intensity. That the images that have been rummaging around in the unconscious suddenly gain a lot of steam and they make a lot more demands on people. Mm -hmm. This can show up in a lot of ways, including breaking your knee so that you are no longer capable of maintaining the career that you used to have. Mm -hmm. So the broken kneecap could be a way that the unconscious is saying enough of waitressing. It's now time to think about something that is closer to who you really are mm -hmm. or closer to the dreams that maybe you've been too anxious to pursue. Too anxious or too wrapped up in this pitched battle with mom. That triumphing over the mom or struggling with her becomes a substitute for achieving something that's more attractive exactly. for herself. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, it's almost like unconsciously we can become very invested in sort of proving a point. Mm -hmm. And then we wind up cutting off our nose to spite our face. It's a very, very eloquent dream. And I can, uh, I can certainly feel kind of desperation and pain mm -hmm. that she's feeling, that she doesn't seem in the context again that she has many options. Mm -hmm. She's literally and financially immobilized because of the leg injury and the attendant loss of income. So she's really, she's really going into that underworld place, which is part of the Saturn return. If she can rest into that as painful as it is, she may be able to find the libido and the guidance that's necessary for whatever this next redesign of her life is going to be. Just one final comment that I agree with you, Joseph. There's, there's a lot of uh, pain and suffering in, in her situation and in this dream. And she has this sort of remarkable dream maker that's showing up with this really profound image that helps point the way forward. So she is being companioned even in the midst of this darkness and confusion. Yeah, she isn't alone, although she feels, or the ego feels, very much alone. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.